Hi, I'd like to talk about the changes in respiratory physiology that can be seen with obesity. Something to remember with obesity is that there are both mechanical effects as well as biochemical effects. Mechanical effects from excess weight of adiposity result in a decreased compliance of the respiratory system. This also causes some impairment in VQ matching. Biochemically, obese individuals have an increased oxygen consumption and alveolar hypoventilation is also a problem. We'll look at each of these in turn. The most consistent measurable change for patients that are obese is a reduction in the functional residual capacity. This graph shows the decrease in functional residual capacity with an increasing BMI. Another way to conceptualize this is that the respiratory compliance has been decreased. There's a shift of the pressure volume curve towards the right in the obese individual. In other words, it takes more pressure to generate the same change in volume. When pulmonary function tests are measured in obese patients, you typically see actually normal FEV1 and FVC measures. Again, the hallmark reduction here uh, is a reduction in functional residual capacity. Even so, total lung capacity usually is normal. Residual volume also usually remains uh, within the normal range, but there tends to be a marked decrease in the expiratory reserve volume. We'll talk a little bit more about this. Among other PFTs, diffusing capacity also typically remains normal. Um, and in the extremely obese patients, it's been noted that DLCO might actually be elevated. The exact mechanism is not well known, but possibly due to an increase in blood volume. So let's look more at functional residual capacity. Remember that this volume is a set volume based upon the compliance of the chest wall and the lungs. This dashed line shows the compliance of the chest wall among different ranges of pressure and the pressure volume curve that's generated. This dashed line shows the same thing for the lung tissue. At FRC, when these forces are at balance, the chest wall is tending to produce an outward pressure or a pressure to expand the lung, and the lung tissue itself is tending to create an inward recoil pressure or a tendency to collapse. At the end of expiration, these two forces are balanced and you have the functional residual capacity. In the obese individual, the chest wall is weighed down by excess adiposity and this, sure, this pressure volume curve is shifted to the right. This means that the balance between these forces is a little bit lower and that's why functional residual capacity is decreased. There are some significant implications of reduced functional residual capacity. One is that the expiratory flow rates are reduced. Another way to say this and see this is that airway resistance is increased. We expect this. In fact, this is normal at lower lung volumes because the cross-sectional area of the airways is smaller. There's less tethering by surrounding lung tissue. However, the specific resistance of the airways is normal, suggesting that the airways themselves are not the problem. At extreme levels of obesity and extreme reductions in FRC, even tidal breathing can encroach upon the closing volume. This can lead to air trapping that increases in the lower lobes and regional mismatches in ventilation and perfusion. The end result of this can be that there's hypoxemia and an increased AA gradient. In fact, uh, recent studies have shown that a mild to moderate shunt is present in the morbidly obese patient. There's abnormal blood flow to the area, uh, to, to the lung tissue, and this VQ matching can be demonstrated by a multiple inert gas elimination technique. In this example of a single patient, the red circles represent pulmonary blood flow, and the open circles represent ventilation. You can see that before surgery, there's a 6% shunt present, and this significantly reduces after bariatric surgery has occurred and significant weight loss along with it. Let's shift gears and talk a little bit about hypercapnia. 
Obesity can cause hypercapnia through a few different mechanisms. Obesity causes a resistance to leptin. It causes an increased mechanical load and can weaken respiratory muscles over time. And of course, obesity is a major risk factor for obstructive sleep apnea. These three things together all can lead to a blunted ventilatory response and the presence of chronic hypercapnia. Chronic hypercapnia is not a good thing. Very briefly, you can see in this graph, obesity patients that also have hypercapnia are uh, significantly more likely to be dead after a hospitalization when followed over time. You can see the probability of survival significantly different between those patients with obesity that are eucapnic and those that have hypercapnia with obesity or the obesity hypoventilation syndrome. Related to exercise, uh, interestingly enough, the VO2 max for obese patients is typically normal as long as they otherwise have normal uh, cardiopulmonary systems. However, the specific values for oxygen consumption and minute ventilation are greater for subjects that are obese at specific work rates. In other words, it takes the obese patient more effort to do the same amount of work. So in summary, obesity causes mechanical and biochemical effects in the lung. There's a decrease in respiratory compliance predominantly uh, created by excess adiposity around the chest wall. Functional residual capacity can also decrease. Along with that is a pattern of a severe decrease in the expiratory reserve volume. It's not only the chest wall that does this, but also increasing pressures on the abdominal contents, compressing the diaphragm. Low lung capacity and diffusing capacity are often normal, and there is the presence of VQ mismatching that can cause hypoxemia. Lastly, hypercapnia can occur, and when it does, it's not a good thing. Thanks for your attention.